start uh, with opening today, I had two questions and two answers, and I wanted to share it with you. It's got some verses to go along with them. But uh, question, a uh, famous Christian question put to us is, uh, what is thy only comfort in life and death? And the answer to that question is that I, with body and soul, both in life and death, am not my own, but belong unto my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood hath fully satisfied for all my sins and delivered me from all the power of the devil and so preserves me that without the will of my heavenly Father not a hair can fall from my head, yea, that all things must be subservient to my salvation and therefore by his Holy Spirit. He also assures me of eternal life it makes me sincerely willing and ready henceforth to live unto him. And as I read that answer, I thought about all the, the verses that we have in God's word that assure us of these realities and these promises that there's great comfort found in Jesus Christ. As we just sung about this morning, uh, trusting in Jesus. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. One of the first verses I thought about was 1 Corinthians 1, 30 through 31, where it said, But of him, speaking of God, are ye in Christ Jesus who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Another place was 2 Timothy 1.12 where it said, For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Another place is Romans 8.1 where it says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Ephesians 2.13 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Romans 5.11 says, But we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Colossians 1.13 and 14 says, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have the redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Another place, speaking of that part about our hairs not falling, we have comfort in tribulations and trials. In Luke 21, 16 through 19, Jesus taught his uh, believers there that, and ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not an hair of your head perish. In your patience possess ye your souls. And then as we go on down that answer, we see the part about the Holy Spirit giving that assurance and comfort. And it said in John 14, 16, And I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Romans 8, 16, Paul tells us that it's the Spirit itself that beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also be glorified together. Psalm 110, verse 3 said that uh, thy people will be willing in the day of thy power. And we see in John 1, 12 through 13, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. In Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, we see the assurity and the, the earnest of the spirit where it says, in whom ye also trusted, speaking of Christ, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. In Galatians, Paul tells us that if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And he also said, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So the second question this morning is, how many things are necessary for thee to know that thou enjoying this comfort 
may us live and die happily. Three things. First, how great my sins and miseries are. Romans 3, 10 and 11 says, There is none righteous. No, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. Romans 3, 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 1 John 3, 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is a transgression of the law. But the second that we must know is how I may, do be, I may be delivered from all my sins and miseries. Romans 6, 20 through 23 says, For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things, whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death, but now being made free from sin, and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And in Romans 7, 24 through 25, Paul says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. But Romans 8, 2, right after that said, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And then thirdly, how shall I express my gratitude to God for such a great deliverance? And the 103rd Psalm is what I want to finish with that comes to my mind. He said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like to eagles. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west so far hath he removed our transgressions from us like as a father pitieth his children so the Lord pitieth them that fear him for he knoweth our frame he remembereth that we are dust as for man his days are as grass as the flower of the field so he flourishes for the wind passeth over it and it is gone and the place thereof shall know it no more but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto the children's children to such as keep the co his covenant and to those that remember his commandments to do them. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens and his kingdom ruleth over all. Bless the Lord, ye his angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his host, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. So our comfort in life and death and how we enjoy these things are all found in Christ Jesus. God is worthy of all of our praises, and we ought not to forget his daily benefits, the great work he's done to free us from the law of sin and how he's removed our transgressions so far as the east is from the west. All these wonderful things that God has done, to us, done for us who trust in him. So truly, as the song said this morning, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody. I tell you, winter has come back, which I'm glad to see it. Our title of our lesson is Confident Faith. So the question for today is how often do we worry about something? 
Now, being concerned about something, yeah, it's a little bit different than being worried about something. You know, concern is having a sincere interest in. Worrying is, yes, being concerned, but you're also troubled. Having distress, maybe some mental anxiety over it. Something that's on, it's just on our mind and controlling our life to some degree. Now, have we ever worried about finances? Worried about how am I going to pay the bills? Or my car, man, it's getting old, it's unreliable. And I don't have m money to buy another car. Maybe worried about our children. How are they going to make it with the prices so high right now? Go to the grocery store and, and, uh, and really anything else that we may need. Everything's so high. Worried about our country, how it's changing for the worst. Crime is high. Illegal immigration is higher than it's ever been. People are coming in our country that probably don't have the same values that we have. Some are coming in that's probably wanting to cause us harm. Our government, it seems to want to protect criminals and illegal immigrants more than they want to protect U.S. citizens. You know, we could go on and on. I mean, we could spend all morning talking about things that we could worry about. You know, this time, this time of the year for people that grows apples and peaches, it's a time that we can start worrying. You know, buds on the trees, they're going to start breaking. We can worry all the way through April that one night it can wipe out our whole crop. So the question is, how helpful is worrying? You know, I know I've worried about things before. My mind, it starts racing and, and you're thinking about what might happen. But something, you know, I've noticed over time, it didn't really happen the way I was worried about it would. You know, so the good, so, so what good, what good is worrying about something? I can tell you this what worrying will do. It can shorten your life, cause all kinds of health problems. Possessions, though, also is something that, that can cause us worry. A person will try to, they'll try to have enough to survive or maybe to live comfortable. But then they have a fear that something may happen to their possessions. If you haven't noticed, our lesson is about worrying. Jesus, though, he tells us not to worry. God, he is bigger than anything that we may ever face. Putting our faith in God, that takes away worry that we may have. Jesus, he begins teaching his disciples about actually having the proper perspective toward possessions. He teaches that, yeah, we shouldn't covet. You know, covet what someone else may have. You know, shouldn't, you know we shouldn't be selfish. Maybe, you know, we shouldn't be greedy. Because the only thing that does is it going, it's going to cause problems for us. He also teaches that putting or that our that faith in putting our trust in God is not is not compatible with worry. It's just like us trying to mix uh, uh, oil and water together. It doesn't mix. In verse twenty two in our lesson, and he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life that ye shall eat, neither for the body, what ye shall put on. So he's teaching his disciples, and he tells them, take no thought for your life. 
what Jesus is telling his disciples is not to worry. Put their faith and trust in God. You know, like I say, one reason, one reason a person tries to get as many possessions as they can possibly can is so they can be secure and in control of their life. Human nature, that's, we're to, you know, we want to protect ourselves. You know, they teach in school to look out for number one because no one else will. You know, that kind of teaching, though, is wrong. Jesus is saying not to worry. God, he will provide what we need. Now, Jesus is not saying that we're not to be concerned about our food and shelter and things like that. You know, we're, but we're not just to sit back and wait on God to provide. You know, we're to work and we're to do what God is leading us to do. What Jesus, what he's pointing out here is where is our primary focus? Is it on earthly things or the kingdom of God? In verse 23, the life is more than meat and the body is more than raiment. So Jesus here is saying not to worry. Don't worry about what you eat or what you wear. There's more to life than these basic things. What Jesus is offering is far more than what this earth can ever offer us. In verse 24, Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor weep, which neither have storehouses nor born, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? So Jesus describes a raven which by Jewish law, that bird was unclean. It was an unclean creature and was one of the least respected birds. A raven is what we know as around here as a crow. They don't sow seed. They don't harvest their crops. But they sure can mess up what you sow. <laughs> Plant a few rows of corn, let it get up two to six inches tall. They come by and they'll pull it up and eat the seed. Apples and peaches, they will land in a tree and they won't peck just that one apple. They'll peck every apple around, just take one little bite out of every apple. So for us, they're also, they're an undesirable bird. But God takes care of them. They don't have to plant. God will feed them. So Jesus says, how much more are ye better than the fowls? You know, the crow is part of God's creation. But we, we're created in God's image. He'll take care of the birds, but how much more he will take care of his people. As a child of God, we're valuable. I'll say that again. We all are valuable. And God's going to take care of us. In verse 25, In which of you with taken thought can add to his statue one cubit? This here means a couple of different things. You know, a cubit was a measurement. It was the length between the elbow and the middle finger. So that's a cubit. Uh, a statue refers to a lifespan. So Jesus is saying, we shouldn't worry about our height. No matter how hard or how much we do to try to get taller, a net cannot get any taller. <laughs> worry about how long we live. Why should we be worrying? 
We can't make ourselves live longer. Now, people try. They try to stay in shape and exercise, and, and they jog and run and ride bicycles up and down this mountain. And I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with trying to stay in shape. I'm not saying that at all. We're to take care of our temple, the, the temple. But God, or but, but people in great shape, they die just like everyone else. Jesus is saying worrying is useless. All it does, all worrying does is show a lack of faith in God's plan for our lives. Verse 26, And ye then be not able to do that thing which is least. Why take ye thought for the rest? So if worrying could not change the least thing in our life, then why should we worry over the bigger things in our life? Worrying has never solved anything. Never has. Anxiety and worry, man, it's not worth it. All it can do is cause harm to our body. Verse 26, or 27. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toll not. They spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like ones of these. So lilies is actually mean a wide range of wildflowers. You know, something I, I enjoy, I enjoy going up on the parkway. I haven't been up there in a while. But I enjoy looking at the fields and seeing the beauty of God's creation. I love going to the look-offs and just seeing just as far as the eye can see. But in the fields, the wildflowers and the grasses that grow, God, he has sent rain to water, to water it. And, and it, it seems like the grasses and flowers, they grow with very little effort on their part. God is taking care of them. Jesus is saying that if God, if he, if he can take care of the grass and the flowers, we can surely put our trust in God that he's going to take care of his children. In verse 28, if then God so clothed the grass, which is today, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? You know, flowers and grass are, they're pretty, they can be pretty today, but the next day their life cycle is ending. They're blooming one day and they begin dying or drying up or dying the next. You know, back, back in biblical times, the reason it says cast into the oven, wood was not always available. It wasn't plentiful. So what they would do, they would gather up the dry grass to put in their oven so they could be able to bake their bread. What this is symbolizing is that life on earth, it's short. Jesus again expresses how much greater that God will take care of us for what he created in his image and what he does for grass. He says, ye of little faith. You know, everyone's faith is little compared to what it could be. We can worry about things and instead of putting our trust and faith in God. You know, Jesus is telling, you know, his disciples what he is saying. Hey, it, this is the truth. God loves them. And he's going to take care of them. Put our trust and faith in God. In verse 29, And ye seek not ye what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of double, mind, double, double full mind. 
Seek here is meaning what a person craves for. Jesus is saying, stop craving for material things. God, he, he, know, he knows what we need. When we crave for something, all it does is it causes our focus to be on something that we don't have. It can cause anxiety, cause trouble, because our focus is where it shouldn't be. In Matthew, I need to get my Bible. Or if you're going to put it up there, I'll just read it off the screen. Matthew 6, 30 through 34. Wherefore, ye, wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe ye, O ye of little faith? I have a hard time seeing. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye shall have what ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore, take Therefore, uh, take therefore no thought for the, for the morrow, for the morrow, morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient to the day is the evil thereof. In verse 30, For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your father knoweth that he have need of these things. People of the world, they seek after or crave expensive things. Buying clothes. <laughs> Many people, they buy only brand names such as Talbots. I don't have a clue what that is. That's why Annette sold me was something very expensive in clothing. Movie stars, they buy dresses that will cost thousands of dollars. And they could have gone to Walmart and got something kind of similar for $50. <laughs> and these dresses, a lot of times, they only wear one time. The world is materialistic and is consumed with possessions. But a person like this, that's consumed like this, they have very little room left in their heart for God. Now, there is nothing, let me point this, there is nothing wrong with having possessions or having things that's even expensive. There's nothing wrong with that. God, he, he gives us things for us to enjoy. But something we may get confused though, is with our wants and with our needs. The key point, this is the key point here, is where is our priorities? What is in our heart? In verse 31, But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all, thing, all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus says instead of focusing on worldly needs, we should seek the kingdom of God. Submit to God and strive to live by His standards. Instead of pursuing earthly possessions, which can cause anxiety, like some people try to keep up with the Joneses, we should pursue things that involves the kingdom of God. Jesus says when we put our full trust in God, then all these things will be added to us, what we need. Because he says, all, thing, all these things shall be added unto you. What we need or what we think we may need 
a lot of times we're just thinking on the short term. Just think about that. A lot of times, man, I need this. It's just for the short term of our life. But our Heavenly Father, He knows what we need the best. Not only the short term, but also the long term. He knows what's best for us for eternal perspective, you know, from an eternal perspective. In verse 2, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So Jesus says to fear not. We have no reason whatsoever to worry. He's a child of God. God delights in giving his children the kingdom. In fact, if you think about this, in fact, we already possess it, possess it, and we receive its fullness in the end. Our name, I love this, our name is in the book. We can take good pleasure of knowing this. We have a loving Heavenly Father that blesses us every day. He deserves our praise every day. In verse 33, Sell that ye have and give alms. Provide yourself bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not. There where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupted. Sell that ye have and give alms. Now Jesus here is not saying that we need to sell everything that we have. God, he gives us possessions so that we can serve him. What we shouldn't do is hoard up our possessions. Accumulation of wealth can easily lead to self-reliance and maybe even some arrogance. We see, oh, we see that today with the elite, the elite people looking down on us peasants. What Jesus is saying is that we're to use our possessions to serve God. And, 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 and we shouldn't tempt God to use, to use God to require possessions for us. You know, last week, part of our, our lesson was what, do, what does people pray for? You know, most people will pray for what is best for them. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to use God to achieve this. Now, these people are the ones that God may say, sell ye what ye have and give alms. You know, bags in this verse can refer to a money belt. You know, when Jesus sent out the 12 disciples, he instructed them not to take any gold, not to take silver or copper to put in their money belt. Instead, they were to trust God is they ministered in his name. You know, treasures on earth can cause anxiety, can cause worry, because we possibly may lose them. A person can put their earthly possessions or earthly treasures maybe in the stock market, and it can be good today and it can be gone tomorrow. But our treasures in heaven, it says, it faileth not. We have no cause to worry about our heavenly treasures. In fact, we can rejoice knowing our treasures are there waiting on us. No, no thief can steal or take. Our last verse, for where your treasure is, there is where your heart be also. So here's the key point of our lesson. No matter how much we have, or no matter how little we may have, what matters is where is our focus. Making money or seeking God. Where our focus is, that's what's in our heart. 
It's just that simple, very simple. Jesus he, here, he tells us, do not worry. Put your trust in God, and he's going to meet our needs. He knows. He knows our needs, and he wants what's best for us. And that, I like this, and that's what we can take to the bank.